Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the John and Jacob Show. Uh, I am John Fowler, a co-founder of International Intrigue and a former Australian diplomat in China. With me every week is Jacob Shapiro. He's the director of uh, geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Now, this week, Jacob, I'm in Chicago, back where I used to live as recently as a month ago, uh, for the Democratic National Convention. I know you're very jealous, but as I look out the window of my hotel right now, I am making eyes with uh, what looks to be like a Secret Service sniper. So if I'm a little uh, rattled during this week's episode, that's why I've got a, I've got a probably a giant sniper rifle trained down at me. So I don't know how I'm supposed to outdo that intro, but it's National Pecan Tort Week, so maybe treat yourself to some pecan pie while you try to relax. <laughs> Just to ease my nerves with uh, with peak, which, which which I would call pecan pie, by the way. But um, yeah, it's 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 the only word in the English language that sounds more sophisticated coming from the southern pronunciation than the northern pronunciation. That's true enough. That's true enough. Again, August is not proving to be a slow news uh, month like it normally is. We're going to talk about. Kamala Harris. Obviously, I'm here at the DNC, and that's the big news of the week. Uh, we're going to talk about a Red Sea tanker that's been attacked by the Houthis, kind of fallen off the radar there, uh, and also Elon Musk, who always seems to make the news. Uh, why don't you kick us off, Jacob? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm dying to know if you've been rubbing shoulders with Lil John as, as you've been hanging out uh, in Chicago. But, I mean, um, obviously. 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 You, you, him, and the sniper walk into a bar. That's a, there's a great joke line in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> but I think the thing that we want to talk about is, aside from all the, and there's been a lot of coverage of Kamala and the Obamas and the Clintons and everybody else coming on, um, but the real thing that has caught my eye, John, is she's looking good in the poll numbers. Um, she's caught up to Trump, not just in national polls, but even in a lot of battleground states. So let's just rock it through them really fast. Mm -hmm. um, she's ahead of Trump. 40 point, uh, 45.6 to 44.4 in Arizona, 46.8 to 43.4 in Michigan, 44.9 to 44.5 in Nevada. So that's Tate. She's up uh, tight. She's up 47.8 to 44.1 in Wisconsin. Um, the real kicker for me, 46.4 to 44.8 in Pennsylvania. Um, the only real battleground state where Trump is, is keeping a lead is in Georgia, my home state. Uh, where he's up 46.6 to 45.9. Um, the interesting thing here is that, and this is something we didn't even put in our show notes, but um, you know, it looks like maybe RFK Jr. is going to drop out at the end of this week. At least that's what the scuttlebutt is. And in every single one of those state polls that I mentioned, he's polling between 3 and 5%. Um, so if he really does drop out and these polls reset themselves, it'll be interesting to see if Kamala's momentum can stay pushing forward. It'll also be really interesting to see if this is just the sugar high of all the media attention, or if a performance in a debate, or if once we get to know Kamala a little bit better as a candidate, that the shine is going to wear off. But the shine only has to last to November to put her to catapult her into the into the White House. The last thing I'll say, John, before I turn it over to you, and I, I want to let you cook because I know that you're on the ground there. Um, the New York Times published an article earlier this week. The title of the article was Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris inside their quietly close <laughs> bond. Hillary, do you not understand that you're the problem that you lost? And like, this is not a good thing. And I'm joking on that score, but there is, I have this nagging concern that every single media publication, they're against Trump. They don't like Trump. They're talking up the polls. It's like turning into the kind of echo chamber that happened when it was Clinton Trump, when everybody thought Clinton was just going to tap dance into the White House. And then suddenly it was a Trump surprise. Now, I don't think Kamala is going to make the same mistake of, say, not campaigning in Wisconsin. So it's a completely different mm -hmm. race. But I will say I have this little bit of deja vu where it's like, OK, I think it's a little bit early to crown anyone. Just a couple of weeks ago, everybody was crowning Trump post assassination attempts. So what are you seeing on the ground and what do you make of the polls? Yeah, okay. There's a ton to unpack there, um, including the Hillary Clinton uh, cousin Nostra kiss of death. Uh, <laughs> I look the, the obviously the, the mood on the ground here in Chicago, a staunchly liberal city uh, for the you know orgy of politics that is a, a national convention is exceptionally positive. So that's you know you can almost throw that out. There's there's no real kind of takeaways from from the week here, other than to say. I am surprised by the energy and the enthusiasm. Um, the protests, there are protests on the ground. I was I was kind of stuck in in one uh, on Tuesday night outside the United Center, um, which was largely peaceful. I know there was there was there was some there were some clashes outside the Israeli embassy. It's all it's all sort of pro Gaza kind of protest, but they've done a pretty good job of minimizing them. Um, there hasn't been a lot of dissent in the ranks. So I think that the, the reporting on the ground here is the energy is real, and there is going to be a sugar bump 
in the polls from this convention. I'm almost certain of it. Um, the speeches have been pretty good. Obama's dominated the the news cycle. Waltz is domina- uh, dominating the news cycle this morning. So that's pretty standard stuff. I agree with you that uh, the media is in the tank for Kamala Harris, um, but I think it's different this time purely because no one that I talk to on either side is necessarily discounting Trump in the way that they did uh, in 2016, or at least mm-hmm. not to the extent they are in 2016. You know, you hear analysts saying like, well, it's still Trump's to lose. It's still, you know, it's still anybody's race. And I, and you've heard that message in the Democratic National Convention as well. Obama said, you know, very good, but we've got a race to a race to win here. So I think everyone is very aware of that lesson from the Clinton um, the Clinton years. So I don't think they're going to make the mistake of, of taking their foot off the gas. I will say there are two more dynamics that are really interesting to me. Trump is doing the the old tricks of saying outrageous things to try and win the news cycle and people aren't paying attention. Uh, He's attacking Kamala. He's saying, you know, he's he's making outrageous claims about the revision down in jobs um, uh, that came out yesterday, which, you know, is a fairly standard thing to happen. And even I think most Republicans would say it's not a government's conspiracy. Trump's trying to do the thing where he says something to get the news cycle and no one's paying attention. That's a big difference in the dynamic. And two, I think the idea that um, the, the the idea that the polling is even kind of it, it, I guess it's I guess it's directional, but it's there's so much. Uh, a little over a month ago, Trump hadn't been hadn't had an assassination attempt. Joe Biden was the candidate, and Kamala Harris was giving last night's speech instead of tonight's speech. The idea that this race is over, regardless of who you think is going to win, there's just so much unknown between now and then. So the polls. Yeah, if the election was tomorrow, I think Trump, Kamala Harris would win. But you're crazy if you don't if you make a, an assumption before. I think probably like early October. Yeah, I mean, I, I hesitate to rely too much on anecdotal data, but I do have some friends who are in in the Upper Midwest. And for instance, I, I talked to a friend of mine who's in Minnesota who generally skews conservative, and I asked him what he thought of Walls, and he gave me all the normal sort of conservative talking points that he was terrible, that he was over progressive, that he was getting railroaded by the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, things like that. And I think one of the difficult things about this election is that it's really not about what's happening on CNN or the me- the media headlines or the polls or anything like that. It's coming down to tens of thousands of votes in these battleground states um, where Biden had a particular charm and a particular charisma. And it's going to be down to whether Kamala can convince those people that she has that same charm, that she's fighting for them. I think it's why Walls was such a good pick. It makes me want to drive through Pennsylvania with you and see what signs are out. Because I remember driving through Pennsylvania with yeah. my grandmother and my aunt as I was visiting Civil War battle sites, because that's my idea of a good time. And we were struck uh, <laughs> that this, this was when everybody thought it was going to be Clinton. It was Trump signs everywhere. And it didn't matter what the polls said. It was that was sort of what came to be true in the end. So part of me thinks, you know, we just got to be on the ground and see what's actually going on in these places, because it doesn't matter what what's happening at the top. It matters in those really small in between areas. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and the last note before we move on to, you know, more substantive geopolitical questions is I have been not shocked, but it is notable the lack of policy coming out this week from the Democratic National Convention. There has been almost no mention of anything specific about what uh, a Harris Waltz ticket would do about well, foreign policy, domestic policy. They've said some vague things about, you know, economic policies that we beyond the scope of our show. But, um, you know, I think this is modern politics. We saw it in the UK, Ming Vaz strategy. Don't make yourself a target. Don't don't give yourself anything for the opposition to, to hang um, a legitimate critique on uh, and just go with the vibes election, which is what this week in Chicago has been all about is getting the vibes going. And, and I think it's been successful on that front. But enough on that. Let's um, let's pivot to some some global issues that are of importance. Uh, the first one I want to talk about, Jacob, and I know you're going to have opinions on this, is that uh, a Greek flagged oil tanker with 25 crew members on board uh, has caught fire after it was attacked in the Red Sea uh, around the Arabian Peninsula. Um, it's called the Sonion, I believe. It's a Greek flagship, as I said. It was making its way from Iraq to Athens with oil. Um, and it was attacked by more than a dozen people on two small boats who were firing projectiles, uh, weapons at the ship, um, and essentially made it catch fire and 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 it disabled its engine. Um, about 77 mi- nautical miles off the coast of Yemen, uh, so that's your clue as to who is responsible. The Houthis, who are operating uh, from Yemen and have had for for a number of months, I mean, all, I, I, at least half a year, have been kind of attacking ships as they go around the Gulf uh, to to disrupt global shipping. They're backed by Iranians, for those folks who aren't kind of living and breathing this issue. 
Um, they haven't, I, I should say the Houthi rebel group hasn't claimed responsibility for the attack, but I think there's no doubt who's involved. Um, and the, the 29 ship uh, mariners, I guess, the, the, the folks on that ship have been rescued by a French destroyer. Now, Jacob, we haven't talked a lot about this issue. It's an issue that's, there's nothing new in this specific uh, piece of news, this attack, but it's something that's fallen off the headlines. And I think, you know, some folks who don't watch this as closely as us might be surprised that this stuff is still going on. Um, you know, the Houthis are causing havoc, raising havoc, uh, causing insurance premiums to rise, shipping costs to rise. What's your take here? Is, there, is, is this just kind of more of the same or is there something going on? For the Houthis, it's more of the same, but I really want to zero in here on the shipping part of the story because something is happening with shipping and it's being ignored. And for all the, the talk of, you know, this is the year of elections and all the crazy things that have happened in the world, I have a hunch that 20 years from now when historians look back at this year, the thing they will write about as being the most important thing uh, was how a ragtag bunch of militants in Yemen were able to grind global shipping through the Red Sea to a complete and total halt, which is what the Houthis have done. Um, shipping through the Red Sea, which goes through the Suez Canal, is down roughly 90% um, from where it was before um, October 7th and everything that happened there. So they've, they've literally changed the way that trade is happening. Now, because of low oil prices, the world hasn't really felt the impact of that because um, you know ships are going around Africa, around the the Cape down there. And that means you need more ships and it means costs are up a little bit, but you know, by and large, you're not feeling uh, the increase in those prices so much, but that's beginning to change. And if you look at a bunch of different indicators, whether it's the Drury World Container Index, that's up almost four times year on year. Um, if you look at, you know, sort of month on month uh, rates of increase and things like that, I'm looking at a CNBC supply chain heat map uh, right next to your beautiful face here. We're talking about increases that are between 36 and 41%. Uh, month on month and increased additional charges, general rate increases by almost 140%. You mentioned ins insurance premiums. Insurance premiums have gone through the Red Sea, have gone somewhere between 0.07% where they were in October to anywhere between 1% to 2%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a 2,700% rise. Um, you start Digging even a little more, you've got certain you know key groups like Sea Intelligence that are forecasting Asia Europe spot prices uh, could increase to levels not seen since COVID. Remember the supply chain disruptions of COVID and how much shipping costs then? They're thinking about um, you know twenty thousand dollars per forty foot container, um, which could even go up to thirty thousand, which is what it was during COVID. And the last piece I want to sort of throw into this is. As a result of all of, you need more ships to make the longer routes work if you're avoiding the Red Sea. And shipbuilding is a place where China has the dominant monopoly. They have 47% of the global market. South Korea and Japan are, are behind them at 29 and 17%. The United States has 0.13% of that market in general. Um, and you, even at the heyday of sort of US shipbuilding, the US was only producing 15 to 25% of merchant ships and things like that in the 1970s. It's one of the reasons I think the Biden administration has quietly started applying tariffs on things like ship to shore crane, shipbuilding, things like that. Um, so I think there's a much bigger story here about the Red Sea's gone, like shipping's not happening through there, unless you're willing to pay really high insurance premiums, or like this Greek flag tanker, you're willing to accept it from the Houthis, you're going around. And what if oil prices go up another $10? What if water declines at the Panama Canal? You start looking, it's a very, very weak supply chain in general. And I'm worried that we're going to we're gonna revisit some of those COVID level disruptions um, in the next year ahead if things don't change. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add to that. You're, you're the expert on, on these kinds of supply chain issues. I would just say that obviously the Houthis are backed by Iran. So um, it's been both notable and unsurprising to me that the US slash the Western Alliance has been unable to kind of stop the Houthis operating in Yemen. I mean, there were elements of, you know, hitting, firing missiles at them to kind of take out these these mobile drones, but there's not much you can do when a rebel group is sailing out to to attack these ships in, in inflatables and using small arms and, you know, rocket, rocket mounted, uh, sorry, shoulder mounted rockets to take these ships out. What I would be watching for is potentially um, the new Iranian president willing to kind of rein these folks in a little bit in as part of some broader deal uh, with the US or if the, the Israel-Gaza war winds down in the future. I'm not hopeful about it, but I mean, it's obviously something that will be on the minds of of negoti Western negotiators, but um, I, I'm not optimistic that it'll happen anytime soon. 
Um, let's move a little bit uh, in the same region, but a little over to uh, the current negotiations over a Gaza ceasefire deal and the rumors about a conversation between Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, it looked at the beginning of the week, maybe there was some momentum for a ceasefire hostage deal between Israel and Hamas. Uh, that seems to be out the window. Politico is reporting now that there's no clear and immediate agreement that the current proposal, which is the strongest form sort of put of that proposal put together to date, uh, Hamas is saying it's not going to accept it, even though Israel has nominally signed on, or at least they're saying that they've signed on. In the meantime, a Fatah commander, not a Hamas commander, a Fatah commander was assassinated in Lebanon this week by Israeli forces. We've had extensive Israeli strikes against Hezbollah in Lebanon again this week. And then there's also a lot of intrigue around whether <laughs> Donald Trump uh, told Benjamin Netanyahu to hold off on a ceasefire deal to wait until Trump was elected because he would get a better deal from Trump, uh, shades of Nixon and 68 and, and Vietnam and all those other sorts of things. Um, what do you make of all this, John? I'm to, you have to keep me in line here. <laughs> yeah, this. I mean, I, 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 I feel that as well. There are two interesting things, I think, and one is uh, the call, which I want to get onto. Um, and the second thing about why the US is being so public about the stages, like Blinken basically said, oh, we're very, very close to a deal. And then it falls apart. And I, you know, I wonder what the US messaging on that is designed to achieve, because Blinken, whatever you think of him, is not an idiot. He's going to understand that there are tons of things that need to happen for this ceasefire to even you know, get signed. And it's unlikely. So I, I don't know why the US is setting itself up for a fall each time and maybe it's to increase the pressure on netanyahu or hamas to sign it like to make sure that the us is looking like it's active and trying its best i'm not sure but i want i want to talk more about that trump call so the, the news here is that trump had a, had a conversation on uh, august 14th so a week ago um with netanyahu and said don't sign a deal before the election because i want this to be a live issue to attack uh, the Harris Waltz ticket with um, they both both sides have denied it and Axios has walked its reporting back a little bit, um, but like we don't have we we aren't sort of constrained by such journalistic practices like Axios we can speculate <laughs> wildly. I put my lawyer's hat on here, Jacob, um, and imagine you're a judge in a courtroom. You have people making the best arguments about what really happened, and the judge's job is to kind of assess people's credibility and and uh, you know reasons for telling what telling you what they're telling you. And here we have Trump, we have Harris, we have Netanyahu, and we have the media. This might be the rare case where I trust the media the most because they have bureaucratic processes, they have sourcing processes. I'm not saying that they're 100% right, but I trust if Axios was willing to report that, if Reuters was willing to report it, there was something there. We know that Netanyahu has a reason to lie. We know that Trump has a reason to lie. Um, and this is what Trump allegedly did uh, back in 2016 with Russia. It's what Reagan certainly did with Carter in the Iranian hostage crisis uh, in the late seventies, uh, literally telling the Iranians to release hostages the day he was elected, oh, sorry, inaugurated. Um, so my sense is that Trump did make that call. It's wild speculation. Um, it's clearly a violation of the Logan Act. It's clearly outrageous, but it's not all that surprising. And I'm sure this stuff has been going on for, you know, probably most election cycles. It's just wild to me now that they're doing this stuff in um, the open. And it, I think, you know, to wrap it up, it goes to show that no matter how much you don't want to talk about the US election, and uh, you know, you don't want to talk about politics, you, the US election and US politics infects everything. There is no geopolitical thing in the world that isn't somewhat tied to how this election is going, how the US thinks about these things, the political stakes in this country. Um, you know, in Australia, my home country, there is a sense still that foreign policy is bipartisan, that it is somewhat divorced from the political process. It might sound a little bit, bit naive, but it's true. Um, in the US, no, there is, there's nothing off bounds. Everything is about winning an election. Um, you know, good policy be damned. Yeah, if, if you're right about it being true, I mean, again, in the grand scheme of things, the Nixon administration, and this is where Henry Kissinger really emerged, um, you know, sabotaged a, a peace conference in Paris between Vietnam Absolutely. and the Johnson administration in the United States. That's the big one. And that was not what Nixon was kicked out for. So that sort of no. tells you that there's a permissiveness in U.S. politics towards this. I also think, though, there's something to be said here about Netanyahu, who in some ways is reminding me of Hafez al-Assad in this in this entire thing. I think it was Kissinger, who I, I hate quoting for reasons we can go into when we have whiskey on the show, John, <laughs> who said that um, uh, Hafez al-Assad, the former Syrian dictator, Bashar's daddy, was one of the greatest negotiators he ever encountered because he wasn't just willing to go to the edge when it came to negotiations. He was willing to fling himself off the cliff 
trusting that he would find a branch to hold on to somewhere so that he didn't completely collapse. I have that sense that Netanyahu has that level of confidence with the U.S., that he thinks that no matter what, the U.S. is going to be there for him. So he can do whatever he wants, uh, whatever he wants. And I think that's exactly what he's doing. I think he's playing. I, I think I think the United States is marching to the beat of his tune right now. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think you're probably right. And he's, and he's probably not wrong in that assumption. Um, let's move on. Uh, this is a story about India. We don't talk about enough about India, I, I don't think, Jacob. It's obviously one of the most important countries on the planet. Um, but this story is Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi is off to Kiev, I think tomorrow. So he's probably on a on a train from Poland, the, the fabled 10 hour overnight train from Poland, mm. uh, right as we record on Thursday morning. Um, he said that he's going to share perspectives on how to peacefully resolve the Ukraine-Russia war with uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky. I'm sure Zelensky will be uh, all ears to Modi's, uh, Modi's ideas. Um, and this comes after about a month after he traveled, Modi traveled to Moscow to presumably do the same with his good friend, Vladimir Putin. Um, I'm being a little bit facetious. I don't, I don't know that Indian and Russian relations are, you know, particularly close right now. Um, but this, this, it's a notable thing that Modi is going to Ukraine. It's the, it's the first visit to Ukraine by an Indian prime minister um, in 45 years. I think it's fair to say he wouldn't be going but for the war. Um, and I think the broader context here, Jacob, that I'd love you to comment on is India has long been a, I think, it's certainly the world's biggest arms importer generally. It's long been, it long get, has long got most of those arms from Russia, um, but it's moving away from doing that. Uh, it's uh, unlikely, I, I think a quote from the Indian uh, Defense Ministry said, it's unlikely to make any new big ticket purchases from Russia when it comes to military um, equipment. It will continue to buy things from Russia to service its existing military equipment, but it looks like it's moving away from Russia as its arms supply. Now, does this mean that it's a, a move towards the West or is this just prudent, planning from the Indians that looking down the pike and saying, look, we, we can't rely on Russia as our, as our arms supplier, particularly when our neighbor is China, and we need to kind of diversify our supply chain. What do you think? The West and English speaking countries in general, um, completely misunderstand India. And I think this is a really good story to talk about how India is asserting its own imperatives versus what everybody thinks their imperatives are. They are not getting closer with the West. That's not their goal. They don't want to get closer with the West. Yes, they've been trying to reduce their dependence on importing arms from Russia. That's not so they can buy them from US or British or Australian companies. It's so that they can build those companies and those weapons themselves inside of India. And they still buy more than 50% of their defense equipment from Russia anyway. Um, I think there's also there's a little bit of PR here because you know Modi was in Russia what six to seven weeks ago and gave a big hug to Putin right around the time that Russia struck a hospital in Ukraine and a bunch of children died it didn't look so good so India doesn't want to be seen as supporting one side or another it wants to be the neutral party it wants to be non-aligned and that's how it pursues things going forward I think it's also important to note India has real interest when it comes to Ukraine uh, we don't talk about this enough um, but Ukraine has an has a substantial military industrial complex of its own. Um, a lot of India's air forces, military transports, for instance, have been slated for upgrades with Ukraine. Uh, and those mm. facilities have not been able to upgrade those planes because of the ongoing war. Um, turbines that are used by the Indian Navy uh, used to be made in Mykolaiv, which is a city inside of Ukraine, which has been utterly devastated by the war. Um, its factories uh, have had its operational capabilities literally crippled by what uh, Russia has done to it. So there's also something to be said there for India saying, okay, maybe you can't make them in Ukraine. How about you come build some of this capacity in India? Why don't we become a little bit more self-reliant here in general? Um, I also, I read a really interesting op-ed in an Indian newspaper. And if you want to understand India, go read the Indian newspapers. Don't read the BBC. Uh, that talked about how this is really not just about Ukraine, it's about Central Europe in general, that India wants a deeper relationship with Europe, and that India sees that Central and Eastern Europe is now becoming a place that is writing its own destiny, that is not just a slave to whatever Germany and France think. And so Modi is in Warsaw, and then is going to Kiev because he sees this as the center of Central European geopolitical power, and they want closer relations there. Um, all, I mean, again, and let's not put too fine a point on it. Uh, last month, India surpassed China as the top importer of Russian oil. 
going to 2 million barrels per day, 44% of India's overall oil import. So it's not like India's jettisoning, jettisoning Russia and will do anytime soon. Um, last but not least, I didn't get a chance to fact check this, and you have to fact check everything from Indian media. So take this with a grain of salt. <laughs> but I did find that one Indian publication said that Modi is going to join a very uh, rarefied club of leaders who have visited both Kiev and Moscow during the war. Your list after Modi makes his visit is Turkey, South Africa, Indonesia, Hungary, and Guinea-Bissau. What have you got, John? Well, I mean, I, I want to leave it on that note as Guinea-Bissau being the uh, the geopolitical hegemon that we all know it to be. But I mean, in one word, and, and I hate this word, and I think you hate this word, but that's multipolarity, right? You're talking about regions, India, Central Europe, all of these regions taking matters into their own hands, building domestic capacity on all these kinds of things that they've long relied on for the last 30 years on global supply chain. So I think it's just another data point in, in the way the world's going. Um, with that, I think there's a good segue, somewhat a good segue to, to an Elon Musk story that we can cover quite quickly um, because it happened in Brazil. Uh, and and this, is, this is a story about Elon Musk. You know, the details I think folks probably know. He's had a tantrum as per usual about um, Brazil's uh, Supreme Court uh, ruling around censorship. He's vowed to shut Twitter down because a judge in Brazil basically said you have to start, you know, labeling misinformation and banning accounts that spread it. Um, the details aren't that important. The, the, the issue is one that is going to crop up a lot, but it's essentially that local countries are taking more control of their internet. They are not allowing tech bajillionaires from the US, pr primarily from the US to control their information spaces. Now we can have conversations about free speech, but I largely find those tedious. Um, Elon Musk has said that uh, he'll close the Brazilian off office of X or Twitter. Um, we'll see if that happens. People are still posting um, currently, but this I think more broadly is a story about tech and multipolarity. We've seen Pakistan have issues with Twitter. We've seen the UK recently um, during the race riots over there have issues with Twitter. My home country of Australia had issues with Twitter um, not so long ago. Uh, this is a story about, I think, multipolarity in the same way that India is going to try and develop a domestic arms industry. Countries of that size are going to try and develop domestic tech ecosystems, information ecosystems, where they can control political messaging uh, that reaches their people because there's this idea that if you are having foreign, uh, foreign, foreign gajillionaires being able to control your political discourse, that's a real political risk for your country. And China's leading the way that they've basically got their own internet. Russia has a semi version of their own internet. Um, do you think people will go? Do you think countries will go this way and, and start to create what, what what I think have been called splinternets? The idea of five or six uh, very different internets that are largely walled off from each other. Well, I mean, you've named the ones that are really capable of doing it so far. So Russia, China, the United States, to a lesser extent, the EU, if it wanted to. But I do think it's it's a really important trend to watch going forward. I think when it comes to the, the specifics of the story, some of this is inside baseball with Brazilian politics. Um, and it has to do with the Supreme Court judge, Alex, Alexandra de Moraes. I hope I got my Portuguese pronunciation there right, who was a critic of Bolsonaro, who went after Bolsonaro on a legal basis and who has been trying to restrict the spread of disinformation. And Musk and Bolsonaro had a good relationship. And so I think there's some level at, at which Musk is taking this personally, which a lot of these megalomaniacal figures do. They, they make everything about them. I think there's also something here. I mean, Musk has very publicly feuded with Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. And I would say that Brazil has not covered itself in honor with its reaction to what Maduro mm -hmm. has done in the Venezuelan election. If you're coming from the perspective of uh, Elon Musk. You know, Elon Musk wants freedom and wants, he, he's been very open about what he wants to see out of Venezuela, which is neither here nor there. So um, I think there's something in that. I think it's also important to at least note with Brazil that they're talking about shutting down operations there, uh, at least what X said, because they're worried about the safety of the staff, about Brazilian security officials arresting X staff because of the the spat with, with Musk in general. It doesn't sound like they're going to shut down the actual platform. Um, so I think it's a little different from some of those other countries where governments are intervening because they want to restrict the flow of information. I think the story raises that concept in a democracy like Brazil, which is really disturbing. But I, I do think it's important to note we're not quite there yet. Um, and then the last thing I would just say here is I think you're right that you, you have your finger on exactly what the right issue here is in general, which is these big tech companies who have access to these platforms who can literally make perceptions the way that they want. And in some ways, perception is reality. You know, somebody like Musk has a lot of control and a lot of power. And even if you think uh, the Supreme Court judge in Brazil has gone too far, 
uh, in his crusade to protect uh, the Brazilian people from disinformation, there's also something to be said for going too far in the opposite direction. Everybody always talks about the freedom of speech, but you know there are some limits to freedom of speech in the United States. You're not allowed to shout fire in a crowded room, at least according to the Supreme Court. Maybe they'll overturn that at some point. But there's also a responsibility that is associated with free speech. And the, the thing that really grates me about Musk and these people who are radical free speech free speech advocates is they never go to that part. They never go to what the impact of free speech is. And that, you know, yes, you can say whatever you want, but there are going to be consequences of that. And if you're not going to think about those consequences, what kind of world are we in? Um, so I think you're exactly right that that's the, that's the bigger picture issue here out of what, what started as a really inside baseball story in Brazilian politics. This isn't exactly like other cases. Brazilian politics is, is, you know, it's deep. It runs deep. It's very complicated, and it's not always um, simple. To, uh, simple to draw lines from Brazil to the rest of the world to kind of find trends. But you're absolutely right to point out that. Um, I, I doubt it's going to be the last time we talk about the tech industry and its um, its problems with foreign uh, foreign regulators. But uh, we're running up against our deadline, Jacob. So let's skip through to our very very popular, uh, uh, if feedback from last week is to be believed. Um, new segment of Over Under. I want to just quickly recap two takes from you last week. You said uh, Over Under, five days until Iran retaliates against Israel. You took the over and you are absolutely right so far. So Israel Israel is has still not been retaliated by against by Iran for the killing of the Hamas leader in Tehran. Um, that's probably a bigger conversation about why not, because I'm a little bit confused. But uh, the second one is that you talked a, a, at length about the MPOX um, monkeypox, now known as Mpox, um, outbreak in in Congo. Uh, now you took the over on a on a year long uh, a year long question, so we can't kind of give you a grade on that yet. But I I just want to point out that like that's something I've seen pop up in the media a lot this week that we aren't taking it seriously, that we aren't haven't learned the lessons of COVID. So I want to give you credit on that for being directionally ahead of the game. We we set the agenda here, Jacob. Uh, when you say something is being not paid attention to, the mainstream media listens and 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 uh, starts publishing. Uh, five or six articles, which is what I saw last week on it. So well done on that. Now, this week's over-unders, let's get to them. Um, why don't you kick us off? Yeah. Um, well, thanks for the kind words, John. I don't think I <laughs> set the trend with anything. I think as soon as the, the the World Health Organization was forced into saying, hey, this is a problem, of course, everybody no, no. was going to come in. All you. Problem. All you. All me? Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Um, John, do you think we're going to get a Gaza ceasefire hostage deal before the election in the United States? Uh, I will take the whatever the under is. No, I, uh, the negative. No, I don't think so. Um, I I just think there's too many moving parts. I think there's too many um, different uh, equities at stake for that to happen. You, you basically need a perfect storm of everyone wanting to have the right incentive to do it. And I don't think that they're going to align. I think obviously the Democratic ticket would like that. They're going to push for it. They're going to do everything they possibly can. But then you've got Netanyahu and you've got Hamas and, and you've got other players as well. So no, I, I'm I'm going to say no. Uh, all right, Jacob, our final one, uh, and this is something that we didn't talk about today, but I think is a big story, and this is over under on two weeks uh, for can uh, Canada's railroad strike. What have you got there? Like with the oil story, I have no clue, but again, this is something that I want people to have in mind because it's that important. Um, the Canadian supply chain has basically ground to a halt because rails are not running right now. Um, and we've already seen impacts on shippers of commodities and other goods. Um, the impact on consumers is probably coming. It's also probably going to eventually uh, affect you know, their operations in the U.S. and Mexico because none of these workers want to bring things into Canada itself. Um, and you know, we're talking about a two-week stoppage. That could cause a $3 billion drop in Canada's nominal GDP. Um, so this could be a really, really big deal. Um, if the Canadian government has any sense, the answer to this has to be under because this is an absolutely massive deal and the implications will reverberate outwards. Uh, but Trudeau is leading a minority government. And he hasn't exactly shown himself to be a very savvy operator in the last couple of years. I think he came to power. He made some of the right calls, but he's had a rough record the last year or two. And whether he's sort of understanding where the direction of the puck is going as a little nod to our, our hockey friends. So I'm saying <laughs> under, but that's more... Geez, I hope it's under because if that continues to go on, that could have major implications. And it's not something that's going to get covered in the headlines because it's, hey, it's boring railroad strike. But when things can't get from point A to point B, John, uh, that's kind of a problem. That's really the whole story, isn't it? Well, exactly. And boring, and boring on the surface, but interesting uh, when you dig in and the stories that we like to cover, Jacob. So it's a fitting place to end this week's, uh, this week's show. So thank you, as always, for your time. 
I should have asked you over under ten bottles of of Dom P that you're going to order with Lil John later. Do, do you care to take? I, a I mean, I, I I don't think there's I think there's no such thing as under on that. Uh, <laughs> right, I yeah. think I think that I think the order is in the in the you know hundreds for that. Obviously. All right. Well, enjoy. Don't have too much fun. <laughs> Thanks.